You're listening to Consolidate That Podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Consolidate That Podcast. We're going to talk today about do's and don'ts of the consolidation based on the maturity level. Today, we have Bill Griffin with us, an ex-CEO of Pathway and the co-founder of VIS. Bill, welcome. Hey, how are you today, Ivan? Pretty good. Very exciting topic to discuss. We have quite a few, we had quite a few conversations about it. This episode will make a whole lot of sense if you guys go to our website, vetintegrations.com and open the strategic version of our maturity model, which is under the tab maturity model and strategic CMM. We're going to be talking about this model. So let's just jump into it. Why do we call the maturity model as do's and don'ts for the consolidators? Well, it's interesting. So it took us a while to get to that very simple perspective, but I think it's a powerful way to consider how consolidators potentially create value and how consolidators can potentially undermine value. And understanding what you should do and what you should not do at different phases of consolidator maturity is pretty powerful. So we talked about the experience that some veterinarians and the teams are going through. And I, and I think that this plays a significant role in that because what we see with consolidators, they have this plan, how they're going to create value f- for their investors and for themselves. And then they start buying practices and it becomes really exciting. So you immediately want after you buy the practices uh, under the pressure of the board and the investors, you want to do the improvements right away. And that's, I think, where we kind of stumbled onto it. Well, when do you start doing improvements? And and that's where I think the whole maturity model came about. So can you talk a little bit about the experience of what happens actually at the practice level and why we want to sort of separate and parse the steps of the process and what may happen if you don't? Yeah, sure. So there's there's a lot of moving pieces. And, and if we take this from a young consolidator perspective or a startup consolidator perspective, which many of the groups in the space fit that category. There, first you have to create the business to become a consolidator and the infrastructure. Then you're obviously going through the BD, M&A integrations, and then ultimately operational phase of the value stream that a consolidator creates. It's a very complex process that requires an awful lot of data, a fair amount of people, and a deep understanding of how you're going to create value with a given group of practices. And the challenge is, is that, you know, listen, this is a race to become relevant and you can't be a consolidator if you don't acquire practices. And, you know, there is so much competition in the space that, you know, slow and steady at this point isn't going to get you to be a meaningful consolidator if that is the goal, meaningful as far as number of practices or EBITDA. So given that, it is a rapid, rapid pace of acquisition overlaid on top of it is the, and it's typically part of the value creation plan, is to improve margin at the practice level. And that's operational improvement post-acquisition. And the combination of those two dynamics, the rapid acquisition, as well as the operational improvement on top of creating the consolidator infrastructure is a monumental task. We know that the organization is being built at this point and the expectation sometimes that the clinics have from consolidator that this is, this is a large corporate structure and everything is well aligned and this is a working mechanism. But in reality, they're developing as well. So in a way, this is sort of like building a flying plane. So Bill, how does a strategic consolidator maturity model explain what the organization is going through? Yeah. So this is, we spent a lot of time thinking about this because it is really all about people. You know, there's a lot of positive energy in this space about creating a better experience for employees and just a better model in general. And we're seeing more of that. We're seeing young consolidators come out with models that are more inclusive. But given that, we spent some time and we created a maturity model with two core pieces in mind. And one is the organizational design and the other is people. For the people side, you know, we looked at behavior, we looked at team development, we looked at trust, and we looked at leadership and actions and how at different phases of growth, those different elements evolve and change. So this isn't just about blocking and tackling and process and systems, but it's also really about the emotional pieces that drive behavior 
and being fully aware of that as the organizational grows. So that's a great way to look at it because the way that team and leadership matures through this process and the emotions change, there's different levels of organizational structure. So what are those levels? What, what is the very first level that we're looking at? So the first level is considered maturity level zero, and that's the initial funding. We chose zero because it represents a foundation or a base. And this is a, this is a critical phase because this is uh, taking a vision and you know looking at an opportunity in the consolidation space and turning it into a real business. And the biggest part of that is the funding piece. The second element is really how you can create value in a crowded space. And you know consolidation today versus you know five or ten years ago is rather different. The value creation plan that comes out of the level zero really needs to be targeted, not only on the acquisition side, but also on the operational side and with a keen eye towards experience. And then it, kind of looping into that experience. So at this point, the team as it's forming at the level of organizations, now we're talking not about the practice, but about the console leader is really trying to figure out who am I? This is sort of the question that the team would have, isn't it? Oh, it sure is. And that's a little bit of the mystery phase that these young organizations are in is, you know, who am I and how do I fit in? It is a critical phase. So as they go into the next level, what happens there? So the next level is when it gets more interesting, right? Level zero is it's the concept, it's the vision, it's the funding. Level one is inception and level one is when practice acquisitions begins. And, you know, this is really where it's quite important for the first practices to be a good cultural fit, you know, be the right financial acquisition. There's a fair amount of risk at this stage, right? It's a new company. And as a veterinarian, I am going to sell my 20 or 30 year old business to a young consolidator that's unproven. And so I really need to be emotionally bought into this. And I need my team to be bought into this because this is really a growth opportunity for those early practices and to truly be founders, you know, to be founders of the consolidator. One of the challenges that's going to be experienced at this level is you're going from a, you know, a core group of people that had a vision and you're moving now into a team expansion. And with that team expansion, you know, there has to be a knowledge development it can't just be a feeling or a vision. It needs to start to be actually structured. And that's a really important step in order to move into the next phase of maturity. Awesome. And, you know, I always put that phase similar to startup in the technical wor world that I'm more familiar with. It's sort of when you're just trying your pitch, you're trying to find these clinics that will be sold on your vision and you're getting to this product market fit. But the team, as it develops emotionally, they're now thinking not who who I am is in the first phase, but now they're the team. And as you said, they're expanding. So, so they're trying to get into this question, who we are together. So then they, they're maturing to the next level, which is process development. So what, what happens there? Yeah. So, you know, since this is a rinse and repeat model, right, of practice acquisitions, and in order to become a meaningful consolidator, again, if you're looking at scale, not as importance, but size, which most are, that you really do need to be relatively efficient in how you engage with and acquire and integrate practices. And if you're not able to do that effectively or efficiently, you don't really get to become a large scale consolidator. So creating process around you know, all of these pieces that are repetitious creates efficiency, creates consistency, increases capacity for the team right? So that, you know, it's not, we do it differently every time that we buy a practice. This does take some time to develop, right? So this level two is about process development. Now, along with this is you're continuing to expand those teams. So this is really teams of teams. And this is where the knowledge development that, that you did in the first level now becomes knowledge transfer because, you know, hey, it was great when there were five or six of us, you know, we all used the same brain to think because we traveled together, we ate together. But now as we're expanding teams, we really do have to pass that knowledge along and it has to be passed along in a meaningful way that someone can come in and really jump right in and to advance the culture, advance the knowledge and create the process as the company starts to grow. 
Yeah, absolutely. And what we've seen with the quite a few consult leaders, because now you're starting to expand on the team, someone is out there sourcing the practices, and then maybe the same vision that you had at the first phase when you were buying these clinics is not the same and it pivoted. But if you don't connect and don't lend it into the common knowledge base, then there's you know slight misalignment when at this level happens, then it really fractures the organization going forward. So it's super important. And if you do it right, the company truly becomes resilient. And this is the phase where the teams are now thinking about why we exist and what is that message? And do we really hone on the message that we deliver? And do we really practice what we preach? That's a super important level. And this is the level where a lot of consultants just jump in and start improving. They're just starting to say, okay, these are the growth levers that we decide to apply. And sometimes it's just too early, isn't it, Bill? We see a lot of consolidators that don't get beyond level two. So, you know, the process development piece, it's not hard to do, but it's hard to do when you're so busy buying and operating practices and putting out fires, especially when your support overhead budget may be rather lean. People are really focused on what's in the moment versus building something for the future. And so this is really a pivotal stage to basically understand and to be out ahead of versus behind. Because once you're behind, it's pretty much too late unless you're going to slow down acquisitions and pause and then basically, you know, clean up some of the process pieces and then start back up, which we are seeing some consolidators actually do. Yeah, absolutely. And we are also seeing how COVID helped with that to slow down and just rethink your processes, maybe uh, not uh, intentional, but actually that was an opportunity for some of them to slow down and rethink the processes. And then that knowledge piece is really, really crucial because when you're starting, you're trying to pull all your connections and all your past sort of engagements, employees, colleagues into your organization, and then you're bringing all the awesome talent. But if you don't have the knowledge transfer mechanism, that could be detrimental to the organization. And the next level then is the value creation tool development. Let's talk about that. What happens there? Yeah, this level gets all the excitement, right? This this looks good on a deck and it also is something that, you know, is meaningful to veterinarians, you know, when looking to potentially sell their practice of what are you going to do for me that I can't do otherwise? What we often see is that value creation tools at the practice level tend to be at best strategic. They're not operational. If we look at the margin expansion functions of a consolidator, you know, if they're looking at lowering labor costs or product costs, you know, we, we tend to see maybe a little bit more of a tactical approach to it, but nonetheless, it is a phase where The goal is to have your core functions built in a way that you can drive them blind, where everyone in the organization understands that this is how we acquire practices, this is how we integrate them, and this is how we operate them. And how we operate them is really important because simply once you close the practice, does not mean that you can suddenly start implementing all of these value creation items? Because you know what? That practice has just gone through a pretty traumatic change event. It's often best to truly understand when to implement practice level change. And then the other element for this phase is refining the fit for purpose, because at this stage, you know, you really now have a critical mass of practices. You got a fair amount of experience of understanding how you create value and what are the best practice fits. And then to understand how to create a more congruent solution to improve practice level value. So this is where the team really is defining what we do. And and these value creation or growth levers that expand the margin, that that's really what we do. And once that's defined, then the organization, as you said, really becomes fit for purpose. And, and the, the resiliency of organization grows because right now you're not just running your processes that hold the core, but also you are now improving. And that's what the investors are expecting from you. This is the moment when a lot of consolidators are facing the additional raise. They're, they are going into B round or just into, you know, additional investors and they will ask them, they will say, you have, you know, you had practices for six months or a year or so, and where are the improvements or at least show us what you do to improve these practices. So if you don't have this well-defined in a third phase, which is the value creation tools, you will find challenging finding additional capital. Well, hundred percent. I mean, just one other comment the what we do is critical, but just as important the what we don't do is equally important. And too often that's potentially ignored. 
hundred percent. Then you just reminded me that basically that's, you know, that is the purpose of this model to show where you jump into things. And, and if it's not a part of your value creation plan or not something that you've defined, you really need to change your strategy before you do that. Otherwise, it becomes a distraction to what you were focused on doing, and now you are not doing what your aim was. So let's go to the quantitatively measured. So that's the level four, and then what the organization is usually doing at that level. Yeah, so level four is a really, really interesting level because at this phase, the organization should be quantitatively managed. And so what does that mean? That means that you know the initial value creation plan and strategy is aligned from an acquisitions perspective through integration and operations. That means that there has been knowledge development and knowledge transfer as the teams have grown. That means that the value creation items and tools are truly fit for purpose. And we understand exactly how those elements create value for the practice and the organization. Along the way, as processes being developed, you know, systems are implemented and metrics come out of those systems. And so at level four, we've got process, we've got systems, we've got teams, and we've got metrics. And that results in the ability to have a quantitatively managed organization where data drives decisions and the value of creation can actually be measured to an operational level. And again, building on the same theme, we're now moving from fit for purpose to a fitter for purpose. Again, we're continually improving, refining the product and the solution, and truly understanding as an organization how we create value. Absolutely. And I love how you said that at this point, you did develop your process, you develop your policies, you now have systems and people to run those systems. And what's super important here is that the what you measure is what is important. And what's important at this level is your value creation plan. So if you promise something to do to increase the value of your organization, if you execute it on that in the first two levels to stabilize and the third level to start applying these growth levers, then in the fourth level, you need to be measuring those growth levers. Because otherwise, there's so much data that the consolidators pull from their PIMs. They determine so many cool metrics, but cool metrics can easily become vanity metrics that are, you know, cool to discuss in the bar. You know, how many fattest cats you've seen last week in Illinois. But what matters is if you said you're going to improve marketing, you want to show what your changes in marketing showed in the EBITDA and overall productivity of the organization. So quantitatively measured is about measuring what matters. Now, we're going to go into level five. What is level five? So level five, I wouldn't call it aspirational because I think that undermines the opportunity. But getting to level four is no small feat. Level five at this point, we're looking at this as a robust organization that has alignment of people, process, systems, and metrics and now is looking to continuously improve, continuously improve at all levels of their value creation stream and value creation plan. This is the fine tuning of economics. This is the highest level of fit for purpose, in this case called fittest for purpose. And this continuous improvement phase is a super exciting phase because everyone knows what they do, why they do it and how they do it. And then it's really opportunity to really change people's lives, pets' lives, employees' lives, and also to create significant wealth for shareholders. My favorite analogy with this level is if you just started going to the gym, in the first four levels, you really build up the mass and you're now strong and big. But the level five is really when you're looking at that new muscle to work on, that definition. So in the organization, you're doing things right. But now you're looking for new opportunities where you can refine certain process or include something new across the organization with all deployment and the program management that you already created to create additional value. So that leaves us with the final level, and that's level six. So what were you talking about there? So level six, it's considered anti-fragile, right? So we started off as fragile. Now we've moved to anti-fragile. We call it built for survival. And this is a future forward phase where now the organization has the ability to look outside of what they consider to be current state 
and look for opportunities that may be very disruptive in the industry. Look for ways to expand. And one example could be, you know, a consolidator buys practices and operates them. But what about e-commerce? What about different elements of client engagement beyond brick and mortar? And there are consolidators that are looking at this. However, they're probably not fully congruent within the model. They're probably not quantitatively managed. And then there's some risk that can come in here if you're leaning a little too far over your skis here and you're really trying to create new business opportunities before you are fittest for purpose. It also is an opportunity potentially to create new purpose. And it's not just new purpose as far as new business opportunities, you know, but this could be altruistic. This could be social. This could be, I mean, look, we're talking about the pet space, right? Really making some meaningful changes in the world of pets and, you know, whether that's euthanasia or shelters or abuse, just think about the opportunities that are out there to make meaningful change. This is the level where we call it predictive. It's a predictive level where you have all your processes aligned, you exhaust the sort of low hanging fruit opportunities of continuous improvement. And now you're really thinking about new strategic horizons. And that's where you're thinking of these new strategies to generate value by pivoting at the whole organizational level. You're anti-fragile and you can really resist all the market volatility and you can predict it by using the data. To be honest, that's the phase that we've never seen. And this is something that we think that the organizations will get there, especially with the data and the data analysis that we can get to. But but this is pretty tough level to get to. So those are your six levels of the organizational maturity. If this caught your attention, guys, then you're probably asking yourself, well, why do I care about the level? And one thing that this helps, and we're going to be talking about it in the future episodes, is that the maturity model is really a tool to create the roadmap to success. If you do know your level, then the model will suggest what is there to do to get to the next level. And to determine your level, you can go to our website, so betintegrations.com, go to a strategic and tactical model, which is at the top of the page, and then you can do an assessment, which will lend you and will show you which level you're at. And uh, we'll be talking about the congruency and other factors in the next upcoming episodes. Bill, thank you very much. It was great to talk about this topic and see you guys next week. Yeah, thanks, Ivan. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for listening to the Consolidate That podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please find us on any podcast platform. Also, you can learn more about us on our website at vetintegrations.com. Stay safe.